Support this podcast via our Patreon and get more writerly goodness. Visit patreon.com slash nanocast to join up. Welcome to NaNoWriMo Every Month. My name is J. Daniel Sawyer. I'm the author of some 20 books, 34 short stories, and numerous articles and other things. And I am your guide on this journey to use NaNoWriMo to level up to professional output levels. Welcome to The Questions, Episode 53. Today, Kane asks... Can you conversationally go over types of editing, the types of things we'd see listed on the menu of a freelance editor's for-hire sheet, and explain what the purpose of that service is, and who would want to use it, why, and when? Well, Kane, I can certainly do that. There's really only four types of editing. There's the copy edit. The copy edit, basically, it fixes your typos. The copy editor goes through your manuscript, marks anything that is or might have been a typo. If you write particularly voicey characters or you have a very good command of your voice and dialogue, then you are probably going to run into problems with copy editors, and you're going to need to go through a few of them before you find good ones, because particularly young copy editors tend to be way overzealous and take the author's voice out of things. Christine Catherine Rush has a brilliant blog post on this very topic called The Copy Editor from Heck, I think it was. And you can find that by Googling it or looking through the Business Rush archives on her blog at chriswrites.com. Then you have the line edit. The line edit is about clarity. It's minor continuity, things like your character had brown eyes in one chapter and blue eyes in another. They are holding a pen when they were holding a pencil before, and there hasn't been any switchover. Basic premises have changed halfway through. Your main character had a son in Chapter 1 and now has a daughter in Chapter 6. Stuff like that. And also um, goes over clarity issues in terms of the writing itself, such as uh, the big one is unclear antecedents. The thing with fiction is that your grammar really doesn't matter as long as the reader can tell what you're saying. And that has a lot more to do with how you deal with your pronouns than it does how you deal with your subjects and predicates and split infinitives and all that crap. There's a certain amount of grammar you need to have right in order to be clear. But beyond that, the English language particularly is amazingly flexible. It's so flexible that almost every major accent group on the planet has a distinct grammar when they're speaking. So your line editor's job is to make sure that what you're doing is clear to the reader. And again, because of how MFAs are trained and the kinds of people that go into editing, young line editors tend to be kind of destructive. So you're going to want to be careful, and you're going to want to send a sample of your writing to make sure that they've got the attitude toward editing that you need. Because it's a hell of a lot easier to deal with a bunch of irrelevant edits in a 5-page or a 10-page test than it is to deal with someone constantly pounding on your writing style through a whole book, especially if you're a young writer in terms of your career length and you haven't quite grown a really thick skin yet. These first two types of edits are really good types of edits to get. You always need a copy edit. And it's a very good idea if your first reader or your core beta reader, and eventually you will develop one or two ideal readers for whom everything is basically written. It's a good idea if that reader has a bit of a line editor in him or her, because it does make life a lot easier, because they're very familiar with your writing style. And it makes life cheaper. The third kind of edit, this isn't one you'll actually see on a freelance editor's menu, because I just made it up, or at least I made up the term. The term is the domain edit. You've heard me talk about this before. This isn't on rate sheets, because this is for specialized stuff. This is your fact check on domain-specific things. Weapons, medicine, science, a particular culture that you've set things in. 
the domain editor is the beta reader that is checking your facts on this issue and making sure that you're not making any blunders that would undermine a major premise of your story. Because those can be very embarrassing. Finally, you've got the developmental edit. Now, these are big picture things. They're like studio notes in the movie business. You write a book, and the editor basically reacts to it in a macro scale. They'll talk about the characterization, the pacing, the characters themselves, the storyline, what kind of stuff is going to be offensive, what kind of stuff isn't going to work. They'll basically give you their review of the book before the book comes out. My opinion on developmental editors is pretty negative, particularly early on in your career. Developmental editors, no matter how good they are, are not going to help you become a better writer any more than listening to audience reaction from your beta readers are. And even with your beta readers, the more fragile your ego is, the more you want to be careful because you've got to foster and champion that creativity and you've got to build up your confidence and your skin because you need to be able to look at someone's reaction to your story and say, well, yeah, you might feel that way, but I don't care. You have to be able to say that because someone somewhere will be unhappy with some part of your story that simply isn't a problem. There's places this kind of thing can be really good. If you've got a writing mentor who's an accomplished novelist, who's got 30, 40 books under their belt, really knows what they're doing, and they're looking over your early stuff and giving you some big picture type of feedback, that's worth listening to because those are people who know what they're doing and you've got a relationship with them that tells you how much you can trust them. You still don't want to let their voice and their concerns creep into your story. But in that kind of situation, a developmental editor-type relationship for a limited time can be a very helpful thing. Another time it can be helpful, one time I actually hired one for my book Down From Ten, which was an unusual book for me because I was adapting from a screenplay I'd written for a miniseries to a novel. Now, the pacing requirements for a novel versus a miniseries screenplay are very, very different, and I knew them well enough to know how different they were. I wasn't confident that I knew them well enough to be able to translate them successfully, particularly on my first attempt at novelizing a screenplay. So after I was done writing, I hired a developmental editor, cost me a pretty penny that I still haven't quite earned back, to go over the story for pacing particularly for the plot arc pacing, to make sure that I hadn't inadvertently set my readers up for an unsatisfactory experience that would have been satisfactory had they seen it on the screen. And she did catch a couple of important things along the way. On the whole, it turned out that I had mostly nailed it, and those couple of important things probably wouldn't have ruined the book. The experience of working with her was invaluable. It taught me a lot about how developmental editorial works at its best, and she was very good. I'm glad I did it once in my life. I will frankly probably never do it again. It's not a really good way to spend your money. It's expensive, and you're basically paying for someone's opinion. And if you want someone's opinion, you'd be far better off getting the opinion of a very sophisticated reader who happens to like the kind of story you're writing. If they draw a line through the book and say, after this point you lost me, and that experience is mirrored by one or two other readers, then you know that you might have something structurally going on that you're going to need to work on. You may not be able to fix it in that book. You may need to put that book aside and write another one and concentrate on structure and pacing as you're writing the next one so that you can learn how to handle it properly. But uh, on the whole, developmental editing is mostly the kind of thing I've been seeing authors who come out of New York and are going indie and are a little nervous will tend to spring for developmental editing because they're used to having studio note style interference in their creative work from their New York editors who get paid to do that kind of thing and are looking to justify their jobs. Now, some of them are brilliant story people. Others, most of them, are just people who like to read a lot and have specific tastes. 
And that's the biggest problem with a developmental editor is one way or the other, when you let someone else's opinion into your book, you're writing a book to their tastes instead of to your tastes. And it's very difficult to sustain a career when you're not writing a book to your tastes, because eventually you're going to get worn out and burned out. It's far better to write your books to your tastes and find an audience that shares your tastes than it is to try to bend this way and that to suit the tastes of this or that reader. That's my opinion. A lot of people disagree. Take it for what it's worth. Those are the basic types of edits there are. I suppose the domain edit in nonfiction would be a fact-check edit, and that's a whole thing for nonfiction. But in fiction, not a lot of editors offer that service because you basically have to find someone who's an expert in the thing that you're worried about. So anyway, that's about the size of it. Thanks for the question, and I'll see you tomorrow. NaNoWriMo Every Month is written and presented by J. Daniel Sawyer and produced by Artistic Whispers Productions. Visit our website at NaNoWriMoEveryMonth.com and leave a tip in the tip jar or join the Patreon to support this podcast. NaNoWriMo Every Month is copyright 2016 by J. Daniel Sawyer and Artistic Whispers Productions and is released under a Creative Commons non-commercial attribution no derivatives license. 